Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to Zion this morning. Just a quick note, uh, we're changing the communion procedure just a little bit, moving one step closer to the way we used to do it pre-pandemic, all right? So the ushers will line, there will be two lines, one on each side. So just follow the ushers. The, if you line up on this side, you come up the rail here and come to this side. If you're lined up on this side, you come up to this side of the rail. And Tim will give you the bread and welcome you to the Lord's table. I'll give you the wine and we'll uh, keep communion moving respectfully and with a deep sense of reverence. Again, this is God's house. It is at his invitation that we gather together as this beloved community called Zion. And we are so grateful to be together in this place, to have God forgive our sins, speak to us in his word, feed us in the Lord's Supper, and just bless us with every good gift of grace. And so with that, we rise for confession and absolution. Beloved, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, was tempted in every way, yet without sin. Yet he was put to death for our sin. Yes, Father, we have sinned, and our sins are too heavy to carry, too real to hide, and too deep to undo. We have hungered for that which does not satisfy. We have compromised with evil. We have doubted your power to protect us. Forgive what our lips tremble to name, what our hearts can no longer bear, and what has become for us a consuming fire of judgment. Set us free from a past we cannot change. Open to us a future in which we are changed because of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. By the power of your Holy Spirit, Restore in us such love and trust that we may walk in your ways and delight in doing your will. Beloved, God the Father of all mercy has reconciled the world to himself through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Because of him, our sins are not counted against us. You are forgiven. By the ministry of reconciliation entrusted by Christ himself to the church, receive his pardon and peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We rise and join in the entrance hymn.
the baptized people of God, we come into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. and serve you in willing obedience. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first lesson today comes from 1 Samuel 16, Verses 1 through 13. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. And invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me him whom I declare to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him trembling and said, Do you come peaceably? And he said, Peaceably, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shema pass by. And he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. And Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen these. Then Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest, but behold, he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send him and get him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. 
Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers, and the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward, and Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Second lesson comes from Ephesians 5, 8 through 14. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true, and try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them, for it is shameful even to think of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is, is exposed by the light, it becomes visible, for anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Word of the Lord. that he was born blind. Jesus answered, it was not this, that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said these things, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, It's he. Others said, No, but he's like him. He kept saying, I am the man. So they said to him, Then how were your eyes opened? He answered, The man called Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, Where is he? He said, I don't know. They brought to the Pharisees a man who had been formerly blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. So the Pharisees again asked him how he had received his sight. And he said to them, he put mud on my eyes and I washed and I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them. So they said again to the blind man, what do you say about him since he has opened your eyes? He said, he's a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he'd been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind. But how he now sees, we do not know, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he's of age, he will speak for himself. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be the Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents said, he's of age, ask him. So for the second time they called the man who'd been blind and said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. 
He answered, Whether he's a sinner, I don't know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I've told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? And they reviled him, saying, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we don't know where he comes from. The man answered, Why, this is an amazing thing. You don't know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, You were born in utter sin, and would you teach us? And they cast him out. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and having found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, You've seen him, and it's he who is speaking to you. He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. Jesus said, For judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, Are we also blind? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say we see, your guilt remains. The Gospel of the Lord. this day because of Jesus the Christ. My brothers and sisters in Christ, again, each of our gospel readings throughout this season of Lent involves a conversation, a conversation between Jesus and someone else. Three Sundays ago, it was a conversation with Satan himself as Satan tempted Jesus to abandon God's plan of salvation. Two Sundays ago, it was a nighttime conversation with Nicodemus. And last Sunday, 
It was a conversation with a Samaritan woman at Jacob's well. And now today, our Gospel reading gives us a conversation between Jesus and a man born blind. And both our Old Testament reading and our Epistle reading this morning once more lay the foundation for our Lord's conversation with this man born blind. In our Old Testament reading this morning, Samuel anoints young David to be the next king. And from a human perspective, David just doesn't seem like a good choice. Not at all. It's hard to see him as an effective king. Right? He's still just a boy. He has neither the strength of a warrior nor the smarts of a politician. He's just a lowly shepherd boy. Why would God choose him to be king? And then in our epistle reading this morning, we hear Paul call the Ephesians and us to live as children of light. God in his mercy and grace changes and transforms our lives. Once we stumble around in the darkness, just like that man born blind in our gospel reading. But now, we live in the light, fully able to see God at work among us. And Paul calls us to live our lives accordingly. And then finally, in our Gospel reading this morning, we have this wonderful conversation between Jesus and this man born blind, who now, because of Jesus, can see, truly see, not just physically, but spiritually as well. So, beloved, let's dig deeper. Our Old Testament reading this morning is from the 16th chapter of 1 Samuel. Beloved, here in our reading this morning, it's all too easy for us to shift our focus away from Samuel and put the spotlight on young David at the very end of the story. But I think that's a mistake. From beginning to end, Samuel is the main character in our reading this morning. So we need to see this story through his eyes as he deals with deep disappointment, the need for change, and new possibilities for the future. Notice the disappointment in the opening words of our reading this morning as the Lord asked Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul since I've rejected him as king over Israel? Samuel knows the man he anointed to be king, the man he himself had mentored as Israel's first king has proven to be an overwhelming disappointment. All of Samuel's efforts to guide the king have ended in failure. For all intents and purposes, the young King Saul, so full of vigor and promise, is now dead. All that's left is the weak and empty shell of the King Saul once had been. And Samuel's heart is grieving. But the Lord tells Samuel to get up and go, stop wallowing in his grief. It's time to anoint Saul's replacement. So off Samuel goes to visit Jesse in Bethlehem because the Lord's already chosen one of Jesse's sons to be the next king. And it doesn't take long for us to see that Samuel is blind, blind to what the Lord wants in the next king. Samuel can't see what's really important to the Lord the second time around. So he comes to this task looking for the same kingly qualities as the first time around. Saul had been tall and handsome. He stood head and shoulders above everyone else. Saul was also strong. He had the reputation of a mighty warrior. The Lord tells Samuel to trust in his divine guidance. 
bit by bit by bit, the Lord opens Samuel's eyes to see the one he's already chosen to be the next king. As each of Samuel's, excuse me, as each of Jesse's sons pass before Samuel, you can almost hear Samuel's disappointment and bewilderment when the Lord says no to each and every one. Are these all the sons you have? Samuel asked Jesse. Well, they're still the youngest, says Jesse. He's out tending the sheep. When Jesse presents David, the shepherd boy, to Samuel, the Lord says to Samuel, rise and anoint him. He is the one. And Samuel immediately anoints David's head with oil, marking him as the next king of Israel. But beloved, for David to be anointed as the next king of Israel, the Lord had to overcome Samuel's grief and blindness. He had to restore Samuel's ability to see, really and truly see, what the Lord wanted him to see. And that, my beloved, brings us to our epistle reading this morning in Ephesians, the fifth chapter. Here in our reading this morning, Paul uses the imagery of light and darkness to call us as Christ followers, not to live our lives blindly, stumbling around in the dark, but to live our lives in the light, empowered by the Holy Spirit to see clearly how the Lord means for us to live our lives. For you were once in darkness, says Paul, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but expose them. Beloved, don't live your lives blindly. Don't stumble around in the dark. Don't be blinded by the deeds of the dark. Don't let the deeds of the dark hold you captive. Expose them for what they really are. See them for what they really are. And live your lives in the light. Live your lives with all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Let your lives be a shining witness to and reflection of the one who is indeed all goodness, righteousness, and truth, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Wake up, sleeper! Rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you, says Paul. And that, my beloved, brings us at last to our gospel reading this morning in John's Gospel, the ninth chapter. Beloved, in reality, our gospel reading this morning isn't just a single conversation. It's actually a series of conversations. And John structures this series of conversations, this story of the man born blind, as a play with both dramatic and comedic elements. It's a structure that's very familiar to John's first readers. In the Greek plays of the first century, only two or three characters were ever on stage together at one time. There might be a multi-member chorus at times, but they only spoke all together as a single voice, as if they too were a single character. So our whole reading this morning is a series of scenes in a play with each scene marked by a conversation. And so I invite you this morning to use your praying imaginations and picture yourself sitting in a theater watching this play. Scene one, Jesus and his disciples to chorus encounter a blind man. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Why is this man blind? 
they ask Jesus. Whose fault is it that he's blind? His parents or his own? And Jesus absolutely rejects this kind of thinking. Sometimes, yes, there are consequences for the sinful choices we make. But sometimes what we experience, tragic as it may be, is simply the result of the sorry state of our human condition ever since Adam and Eve fall in sin. And Jesus comes into our midst to do something about the sorry state of our human condition. Neither this man nor his parents sinned says Jesus, but this happened that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it's day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. Jesus then spits on the ground, makes some mud, and puts it on the blind man's eyes. And then he sends this man to wash in the pool of Siloam. Then everyone exits the stage. And now we come to scene two, the blind man and his neighbors who now form a second chorus. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed he was. Others said, no, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I'm the man. This scene is really meant to be funny, much like a scene from I Love Lucy. Is this man really the blind man they've known for so long? Yes, no, maybe, but the blind man says, Adam, and yes, this is really me. His neighbors finally ask, how then were your eyes open? The man replies, the man they call Jesus made some mud, and now I see. Notice, beloved, the way we as the audience know more than the people in the play. It's one of the key elements of comedy even today as we watch those comedies on TV. It's a form of irony. And now comes the third scene, the blind man and the Pharisee. In the first part of this scene, the Pharisees confront this man because Jesus healed him on the Sabbath. How can this be? Healing can't happen on the Sabbath. It's a day of rest, and God himself rests on the Sabbath. So this so-called healing must be a fraud. Beloved, the Pharisees are now the blind ones. They can't see what's really happened. They turn to the man born blind and ask him, what have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. Notice too, beloved, the blind man's sight is getting more and more clear. He's a prophet, he says. And now we come to the second part of this third scene. On stage now are the blind man, his parents, and the Pharisee chorus. John, the play's narrator, says this. They still didn't believe that uh, he'd been blind and had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your sign, they asked them? Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it that now he can see? The man's parents are afraid of the Pharisees. They don't want to get caught in the middle of this conversation at all. So they simply acknowledge this man is indeed their son. And yes, he was indeed born blind. But they say they have no clue how he came to receive his sight. Beloved, because of their fear, they're now blind too, just as much as the Pharisees. And now we come to part three of this third scene. The parents are gone. Now it's just a man born blind in the Pharisee chorus on stage. And once more, the Pharisees quiz the man born blind. Give glory to God by telling the truth. We know this man is a sinner. Whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know, says the man. But one thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. 
What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? I have told you already and you didn't listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? This last question, do you want to become his disciples too, is meant to be funny as well. This man born blind is really poking at the Pharisees and he's using humor to poke at them. He who once was blind now sees ever so clearly and the Pharisees are ever so blind. Then they hurled insults at him and said, you are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. And then this man born blind, his sight now absolutely crystal clear, says to the Pharisees, oh, that's remarkable. You don't even know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God doesn't listen to sinners. He listens to the godly person who does his will. Nobody, nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man weren't from God, he could do nothing. The Pharisees respond angrily, you were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And then they throw him out. Beloved, notice how this man born blind has moved from seeing Jesus as a prophet to now seeing him as something more than a prophet. He's come from God himself. Yes, beloved, this man seems crystal clear, but the Pharisees are blind as bats. Finally, we come to the last scene in our play this morning. Now it's just Jesus and the man born blind on the stage. Jesus heard the Pharisees had thrown him out, so he goes and binds him again. Do you believe in the Son of Man? He asks. Who is he, sir? Tell me so that I may believe in him. You've now seen him, says Jesus. In fact, he's the one speaking with you. To which the man responds, Lord, I believe. And John says this man worshiped Jesus. There's a bit of a postscript before the curtain comes down and our play is over. Jesus says, for judgment I've come into this world so that the blind will see and those who see will become blind. Some Pharisees overhear these words of Jesus. What? Are we blind too? To which Jesus responds, if you were blind, you wouldn't be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. The curtain comes down play is over. We've seen some great comedy, but we've also seen some real tragedy. The Pharisees expel this man born blind from the synagogue. In their raging blindness, they want nothing at all to do with this man and nothing at all to do with Jesus. Their self-righteousness, their inability to see themselves clearly, to recognize their own sin, blinds them to who Jesus really is and their absolute need for his mercy and grace in their lives. Their self-righteousness excludes them from the kingdom of God in the very same way they excluded the man born blind from the synagogue. But throughout this play, the blind man's vision just keeps getting clearer and clearer and clearer until he sees Jesus for who he is and worships him, something no godly Jew would ever do unless he was absolutely convinced that he was in the very presence of God. There's some comedy here in the fact that by the end of the play, only the man born blind can really see. And everyone else other than Jesus seems to be suffering from some sort of blindness. Even the disciples are blind at the very beginning of our story. Beloved, 
John also wants us to recognize that we, the audience, are truly an actor in this play as well. We see what's happening, and the more the play goes on, the more we're able to see too. John wants us to see ever so clearly that the worship we give Jesus here and now is the very same worship this blind man gives Jesus as well. And the communities John pastored were also being marginalized, cast out, excluded, persecuted for their worship of Jesus, just like this man born blind. Beloved, we too live in a place and time where Christianity is more and more considered irrelevant. More and more we too find ourselves on the margins, excluded. But John wants to encourage us as Christ followers. Because of God's mercy and grace in Christ, we're able to see the truth about Jesus. And sadly, so, so many around us are as blind as the Pharisees. But beloved, this truth dare not lead us to feelings of superiority or self-righteous arrogance. This truth should fill us with all humility as we hear once more the words of Paul in our epistle reading this morning. For you were once in darkness. But now you're light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but expose them. Oh, beloved, thank God Jesus is the light of the world. Thank God he's faster than the speed of darkness. Thank God he beats back the darkness. And he empowers us to live our lives of love in the light. May we, by the power of God's Spirit, keep our eyes wide open so that we can see clearly those precious opportunities to make some mud in the name of Jesus. Apply that mud gently and lovingly, just like Jesus so that Jesus can restore the sight of those around us, even as we've had our own sight restored. Amen. Amen. We rise and tell the story of our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things, visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Beloved, Let's pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their need. Good and
gracious God, we come to you this morning praying for your church throughout the world, for this beloved community called Zion, for our sister church worshiping here in the afternoon in town, and for every gathering of believers in every nook and cranny of this planet. We pray that you would open our eyes by the power of your spirit so that we can see you on the move ever so clearly, so that we can respond to your invitation and participate with you in what you're doing, bringing light and sound and sight to the world through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray this day for those in need, for those experiencing houselessness, for those experiencing addiction, for those experiencing mental health issues. We pray also for those who are ill. We think especially of Kenny and Brian and Mick, Kirk and Richard and Mark, for Cindy Lineman, for Mary Ratzler, for Nancy Miller, for Jim Westerberg's son Jim, and for Gerald Risper, who's still recovering from surgery. We pray also for the homebound, for Dolly and Ellen, for Mark and Ruth and Sky, Wrap your arms of love around all of these people. Touch them with your healing hand. Use us wherever possible to bring your message of love into their lives, to be love, your love in their lives. Lord, in your mercy, we pray this day for those remembering we pray especially for Lisa as she remembers her mom's birthday today. We thank you for her mother's life and for her witness to the power of Jesus, even in the midst of so many challenges in her life. We thank you that you baptized her into your kingdom and you welcomed her home into the kingdom without end. And we pray for Lisa and her family and all who loved her mom that they would remember her with joy and remember your mercy and grace with increasing and incredible joy because of Jesus. Lord, in your mercy, there are We pray this day for those who are celebrating, those celebrating birthdays. We think of Brian and Steve and Mira and Kara. We think of Jacob and Sheila Flagg and celebrating their anniversary. And we, we pray for all of us with great thanksgiving because you pour your mercy and grace, every good gift of grace, into our lives each and every day. Be with us, O oh Lord, and give us eyes to see your incredible blessing in our lives. Lord, in your mercy. And finally, O oh Lord, we pray for our world. We pray that you would intervene as only you can, and that you would use your people as part of this intervention, that you would bring peace where there's discord, that you would bring hope where there's hopelessness, that you would bring joy where there's sadness. Lord, in your mercy, into your hands, O oh Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy and grace through Jesus Christ our Lord.
We rise to sing the offertory. Temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Beloved, our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this to remember me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it. To remember me. Beloved, as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The peace of the Lord be with you always. those who are communing in the pew, take eat, the body of Christ given for you. Take drink, the blood of Christ shed for you. Now may this body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and keep you in true faith and a life everlasting. Go in his love, his joy, and his peace. Amen.
we rise to sing the note to bid us. So we look forward to that as well. And Easter will be glorious, absolutely glorious. We're going to do a couple of new things. We've got the Columbia Brass coming, the choir is singing. So bring family, invite your neighbors. It's going to be a wonderful, wonderful celebration of the resurrection. And we will also have an Easter breakfast here at 9 o'clock before our Easter worship. The fellowship committee is providing a casserole, but uh, we need you to sign up in the narthex and volunteer to bring some fresh fruit or some pastry. Uh, and you just need to know about how many are coming so we make sure we have plenty of food. Also, April 1st, the day before Palm Sunday, is uh, the LWML Zone Rally. We're hosting it here at Zion, so ladies, we'd love to have as many of you as possible here that morning. And uh, for better or worse, I'm talking about these numbers have faces in Rwanda and Africa. I'm looking forward to that time with all of the ladies from our zone. Let's see here. Oh, and then one last thing. I hope you're enjoying the Lenten devotion emails that are coming, and those of you reading your way through the book, I hope that's been a blessing. We're going to host a Zoom call this Wednesday evening. Bruce Strati is going to, to take it on, just to touch base with folks and have opportunity for people to share what they're appreciating, what they're learning, what they're enjoying with this Lenten devotion series. And we'll send out a link to that Zoom call uh, as part of the Lenten Devotion emails uh, in a couple of days. Any other announcements? If not, we rise for the sending hymn when to our world the Savior came. Oh. 